Hey, good evening, friends. We are so excited to be with you this evening. Um, I'm here with my colleague, um, Luke Marshall Beal, and we are so pleased to welcome you to the final community conversation of this 2023-2024 season. Wow. Hi, Mary Margaret. Hey, good Monique. Evening, everyone. Good to be with some dear friends. I see some very familiar names and faces, and we're so happy that you've joined us for this very special closing conversation tonight. Uh, so I am um, a Reverend Mary Margaret Earle. I'm the Executive Director and Senior Minister at the Unitarian Universalist Urban Ministry, and we work across race and place to dismantle racism and white supremacy culture and to advance racial, social, and economic justice. And we do that through uh, many different programs and events and activities and educational offerings um, like tonight's. Um, we have a domestic violence shelter. We um, also have after school and summer programming and that's gonna be the featured highlight this evening. Um, and would you like to tell folks about our five years or four years of community conversations, Monique? Sure, I know it's four years seems like a very long time that we started yes. this, um, but it's been a great, great experience for not only us at Urban Ministry, but also for the folks in our community and in our congregations. So, um, and most people may know this, but I'll say it again, that our community conversations have always highlighted the history, the art, and the experiences of Black and Indigenous people of color. And these conversations have provided an opportunity to raise awareness around some of the issues that have plagued the residents of color in Boston neighborhoods. These conversations have also uh, provided information on how to support organizations in their work to help people of color. And I say thank you to everyone who is joining us for this last community conversation of the season where we allow our students from Roxbury Youth Program to take over. And tonight's program is Gatekeeping Generational Wealth and Collective Liberation. I am amazed and anxiously awaiting to hear from our young people. We have uh, uh, our what we call a commitment minute. Um, and we have a special commitment minute this evening with um, perspective from our uh, the Reverend Tricia Brennan, who is our interim partnerships um, and congregational coordinator. And so we're going to hear from her. Evening, my name is Reverend Tricia Brennan, I serve at Urban Ministry as the Congregational Partnership Consultant. Urban Ministry is at its heart a justice-seeking, justice-building organization. I've always thought you never do justice work alone. You do it in partnership with others because you need each other, it can be hard, and you do it because when you're together you're more powerful and more able to create the change that you're wanting to create. Partnership is a really apt descriptor for UU Urban Ministry ever since its beginning days 200 years ago. It's been about being in partnership with other congregations and institutions here in the city of Boston and beyond. Now with its 46 member congregations, many of whom I get to be in touch with, it is really continued to make that be alive and its new mission tilts it more and more into the community of Roxbury and organizations doing fabulous work here that we learn from and we support. The ongoing work of the services and programs at Urban Ministry continue. I could talk about Renewal House, the tours, the renovation of the Meeting House uh, itself, all that, but really we're here tonight for the youth. And the youth keep this place hopping every day of the week. I'm really excited that we're gonna be able to hear their truth and hear their wisdom. I thank you for being here and for your support of Urban Ministry. We appreciate those words from Reverend Tricia Brennan, and we appreciate all of our member congregations and all our community partners who give life to the urban ministry. And so now, uh, Monique, you and I get to step back. Yes. And, uh, you know, I just hats off to the young people who have been getting ready for tonight um, and trying to figure out what they want to say about the issue of housing, which has been our theme, but we're going to step back. Yes. Uh, tonight and and not talk so much as to listen. 
and I'm happy to step back and let them lead. So we'll Me turn to try young people. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Hello. So we are the so we are the youth council here, and we'll be giving a presentation about affordable housing. My name's Naya, and I'm a sophomore. I go to Dearborn Sim Academy, and I'm gonna be passing it on to my coworker, Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa. Um, I'm an eighth grader at Dearborn Sim Academy. I'm also part of the the council at RIP. I'll be passing it on to Lanaya. Hi, I'm Lanaya Sanders. I'm a sophomore at Dearborn STEM, and I do believe that youth have a voice, have a voice in um society. Passing it on to Zaire. Okay, hello, my name is Zaire, and I'm in eighth grade. In eighth grade, and I go to Dearborn STEM Academy, and I'm also part of the youth council. I'm passing it back on to Maya. Okay. Starting off with our first slide, understanding affordable housing. This will give us an understanding and context for the rest of the slides. So what is the so starting off, of what is affordable housing? Affordable housing is housing that that households can pay for while still having money left over, over for necessities such as food, transportation, and healthcare. So basically, what should be basic human rights and basic human needs. How is affordable housing created? There are three types of affordable housing, and the three types are there. Okay, and the three types of affordable housing are vouchers income restricted housing and some housing is also set aside by the government so first i'll go into and so first i'll go on to vouchers so how do vouchers work when it comes to affordable housing the way vouchers work is you pay a certain amount for your rent and the government provides you with the rest of your rent money so let's say your rent's one thousand dollars and you pay 400 the government will give you six hundred dollars to pay for your rent and you'll still have that the rest of the money that you would be paying for rent left over so you can buy other things such as food, clothes, or even like have celebrate stuff for your kids or just like overall have money left. Now going on to the next type of housing, which is income restricted housing. So what is income restricted housing? Income restricted housing is housing that's set aside for people with certain levels of income. In income restricted housing, you find all different people with all different types of income living there, but some housing is set aside so it's more affordable for people with lower income. So usually this house is, so usually people who live in these houses are students, also people who have lower income because these houses are more affordable and more income friendly. And so you can also afford stuff that you need such as shoes, clothes, and of your student textbooks or things you need or even like you can help support your family with the leftover money you have because you didn't have to pay too much for your rent and moving on to my next point government sometimes the government will set aside housing for people to live in in this type of housing it doesn't have a specific name but this type of housing is set aside for the government and the it's basically based off of your income so it's a little bit like um restricted house like income restricted housing but the way it's different is like the way these houses are built, income restricted housing is usually in apartment buildings and in income restricted housing, you can also find regular housing where people pay like Roman mouse rents, but rent, but the difference is in the income restricted side, well, it's not really a side, it's in the same building and the apartments can be anywhere in the building. But the difference is um, in housing set aside by the government, is usually like your own house. Like it's not many apartments in one place. Sometimes it can be, but it's usually different from income restricted housing. Now next I'm gonna talk about why do some people struggle to find affordable housing? So affordable housing, there's many, when it comes to affordable housing, there are many resources on the internet you can look to in order to like access this affordable housing. But a big problem is some people don't have access to the internet, especially in lower income areas and areas where homelessness is prominent. So the reason why this is such a massive problem is because since people don't have these resources or they don't know where to look, it's harder for these people to find housing. And it's hard for these people, sometimes it's hard for these people to get jobs because they can get stuck at housing that they have to choose what they like have to pay for. Like think about having to choose for food for the week or completely paying off your rent. 
And that brings me to another, and that brings me to another point I have, poor credit scores. When it comes to poor credit scores, poor credit scores prevent you from getting houses, loans, and mortgages. And another problem when it comes to poor credit scores in relation to housing is the fact that if you if you take out a loan, you're gonna have to pay more interest if you have a lower credit score. And that's actually a very common thing in low income neighborhoods, unfortunately, because housing is so expensive in Boston because Boston's one of the most expensive cities to live in. But because Boston is so expensive, a lot of people find themselves taking out loans, mortgages and stuff like that. And especially in lower income neighborhoods, they have to pay more, especially if they have a low credit score. Not only this, but there's also some other reasons that people struggle with finding affordable housing. Some of the issues are some places just aren't built for affordable housing. Some areas just aren't suited for it. Transportation's impossible. And a good example of this is the Bee Lion from Boston College. Now the Bee Lion stops at a certain place and where the housing, that's, that's not exactly where the housing is. So let's say, you get off at the last stop, you're still gonna have to walk to the housing and maybe for even quite some time. This makes it so unaccessible that some people don't even want to move into that affordable housing because they know it's gonna be a struggle to get there every day. So, so leaving off this slide, the main point of this slide is making sure that everybody here has a background to like how affordable housing works, what affordable housing is and how and a little bit about the community, but we'll get more into the communities later. I'll be passing it on to the next one. Yeah. I'll be passing it on to my coworker Diane. That is um, effects on neighborhoods and how it affects houses in neighborhoods. Okay. Um, how does affordable housing impact communities? It affects communities by raising prices and also learning down, changing the neighborhood looks and also changing its availability and history. Um, the positive impacts on single parent households, it positively, well, affordable housing positively affects single parents by helping them being able to pay for child necessities and also household needs. They will be able to save money and especially for parents with low income, for single parents with low income. Um, how can it change the way neighborhoods look, cost, and the perception for people in that area? So like how they're taking benches away so that homeless people can have comfortable sleeping areas outside and also what's it called? Oh, um, hostile architecture. Um, they'll have comfortable sleeping areas outside. And since they can't find sleeping spaces, but uh, sleeping spaces, especially safe ones, the health won't be as good. So like if they're in the cold and on the ground, the most likely will they have higher chances of getting sick and the most likely wake up sore. Um, with inflation prices are raising, it makes it harder for many people, but mostly homeless people and people with low income and people with no jobs and also parents. Um, it makes it harder for them. No, becoming like homeless makes it harder for them to get houses. And affordable housing helps with that by helping them save money. But inflation is also a problem that has to do with affordable housing because it involves needing money to get things you need. Um, some of the things you may need are like clothes, medicine, food, toiletries, and also having to worry about applying for affordable housing. No, and also just that. Um, applying for affordable housing can help. But saving money to also buy necessities instead of using most of your money on your house and the rent. And the things that come with that are like fully paying off furniture, fridges, the water bills, TVs, and other things that you may need to pay off. And now back to how affordable housing can change neighborhood looks. It may alter the amount of space that you have, so like how big or small the household or apartments would be um, based off the looks, since some would be bigger or smaller, depending on the prices of it. Okay, um, put in a position to having to choose between bills and also what they pay. And what happens when people can't afford to live in their neighborhood? So when people can't afford to live in their neighborhood anymore, they will be put in, you know, they'll put at risk of having to choose between to pay their bills. So like their water bills, rent and other things they need to pay off. So like furniture and their health needs, so like medicine, that may lead to them becoming homeless. And it may be hard to keep up with going to work if you can't get ready in the morning. 
or getting ready like how you usually like to. And that may make your, that may make the way you present yourself go down. And if you lose your job due to the way you present yourself, it may be harder for you to get hired since you'll have like not as good hygiene. And can the can rates of unhealth, oh, how can it affect the rates of unhealth people in the city? So there are currently around 653,000 homeless people in the U.S. from 2022 to 2023. And the homelessness rate has went up by 12.1 percent, reaching its highest point since around 2007. Now I'm passing out shit. down. All right. I will be talking about quality of life and public health. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is how does how does house how does housing quality affect people's health and well-being? It affects their health and well-being because if they can't afford if they can't afford to put their health before their payments, it's not really a good lifestyle to live by, especially if you're put in affordable housing. Because that puts you in a position to make you stress about your payments mortgage and stuff like that before you pay your hospital bill, medical bill, get the get your prescription or stuff that you actually need to like remain in the house. Also I feel like also I feel like affordable housing shouldn't shouldn't have people stressing whether or not they should get a they should get a job first, pay their rent and then their health. This housing affordable housing. This housing affordable housing. Housing search. Oh and I feel like a, I feel like housing shouldn't really put people in that position if they've been through enough stress. The next one I'll be answering is quality affects affects the ability to afford health to to afford quality health care. If you can't afford to if you can't afford to get like let's say like a doctor's prescription or like a certain surgery or like some certain treatment and and like if you can't afford that, but you can't afford your rent, it puts you it puts you in a like in a decision making like opportunity to pick one over the other, even though one is more valued in your position than the other, and that can that can put you in a really really hard position on whether or not you you retain the roof over your head or you retain your health. Um. Necessary resources me like medication, access to health care. Having access to health health care is a problem based on where you live. Because if you live in a neighborhood that is less common to have brand name stores or open opportunities to health care and free opportunities like CVS or some different pharmacies like that, it can be really hard for you to get um any health care any help with health or anything that you're going through. Because some neighborhoods and some brands would work around the neighborhoods to purposely put their stores in different positions so that it'll get a profit, more popularity, or it will be known better. This cannot only affect the way people, this cannot only affect the way people retain their health or food or any necessities that they need to survive. But can also affect the stores and these and these neighborhoods' reputations, because moving around to certain neighborhoods to only to only allow and to only give these accesses to certain people in certain neighborhoods is not is is not a fair opportunity to those who need them. Safe and healthy housing. Um, it is important to have a safe and healthy house because. Choosing choosing one over the other shouldn't be the possibility. Or prioritizing prioritizing your health, your job, and your rent shouldn't be hard. Because most people in this position would put their rent first, a job first, and then their helps, which can, which can counterattack themselves, meaning that they would do they would do rent, put that expense, job that time and expense and instead of paying for their health care which would be forgotten they would just keep paying for the rent and go back and forth which can make it seem like 
like they've forgotten about it or like they, they feel like it's not a certain necessity or that they should spend their money on a roof. Um, next part is availability uh, availability for dis for dis disabled disabled people sorry if you're disabled and you need help getting around like you have wheelchair a certain injury that you need help getting around with and like your neighborhood doesn't provide that for like example if you live in like an outdated building or like a not changed in a building for you and you're like in your adaptation like if it doesn't have a ramp elevator or something to help you get up the stairs with I feel like they should they should accommodate for for you specifically because if you're going to put someone in a house so that they can that, so that they can get back on their feet I feel like helping them actually like build themselves up before you build them before you like before you like put them in a position to be in a house and to, and to worry about rent job and food like in that specific order um Also, oh, oh, also back to my point about people not being able to access their health care or other necessities that they should be able to should be able to work, um, reach. Most of the like some of the problem is that they haven't been able to build up a good credit score, or get any money, or like stuff like that, because. Because you could just say that it, that it is as easy as getting a loan from the bank, but how are they going to let you get a loan if you have bad credit score? Or even worse, they can let you get a loan and they know you're not going to pay it back and then you'll be in debt. And the first thing you do when you get money is pay that off. Um, does anyone else have anything to say about that? Before I transfer it, um, I would like to say I think Lissara brought up a good point with the debt part because when it comes to debt and if you don't have enough to pay off those loans, then you're gonna have to pay higher interest rates, especially if your credit score is bad, which it probably will be if you're not already paying off those loans at like a rate the bank wants you to pay it off at. That's all I have to say about that. All right, I'm gonna pass it on to Renata. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to be talking about redlining and historical context. For people who don't know what redlining is, it's a discriminatory practice that consists of the systematic denial of services such as mortgages, insurance loans, and other financial services to residents of certain areas based on their race or ethnicity. Basically, to put it into more simple, simpler ter terms, it's basically when you're when you have the money to buy something at the grocery store or anywhere, and they deny you because of the way that you look in like terms of like your skin color and stuff. So how this affects housing today is that it's when it's denying people of housing, it's putting them in, it's more putting them in position that's not good for them or just unhealthy, and this also leads to unhealthy housing. Unhealthy housing is where it's a place where people go like that doesn't um that isn't safe for them or doesn't accommodate to them like well like connecting back to what Sarah said about the wheelchair ramps and um the elevators that disabled people might need and why it is important to um understand the historical this the historical discrimination is that it can help us understand why people are in these communities and what i mean by that is like most people think that being in Dorchester is just like all that you can afford. Most most of the time, it's just because of what people can find. When you're being denied of some of some place, you're just putting you you need to be somewhere. Like you can't be on the streets because that's bad for you. But that's that's the way it is. Like you're you're stuck. Sorry. <laughs> you're <out of> <laughs> yeah. Like um, you're stuck on the streets because a place denied you based on the way that you looked. So now if you go to the next slide, you guys will get a sense of what I mean by redlining. So on the left, green means it was low, it was low at risk, and blue is moderate. I mean, green, blue is low risk, yellow, yellow is declining, and red was high risk. 
As you can see, Dorchester, Mattapan, and Rossbury were the places where it was high risk. That's mainly the places where um, Black people are people that can't really, like, minorities. yeah, also minorities go because they can't, they can't go anywhere else. Now passing it on to anybody, now passing it on to anybody who would like to add. Um, adding on to what Lanai said about redlining, redlining affects communities today because like Lanai said about redlining, banks, but banks do I want to like, banks want to invest in like put their banks in places with like that were at high risk because a lot of the time places where minorities were were associated with crimes such as like stealing, robbery, things like these. And because of that, banks didn't want to go in these areas. And if they were, they would charge higher loans. And this made it so black people can build up generational wealth, meaning that they couldn't like get housing or to pass it down to their families. So the money from that house like pass on. So that's a big part, of, like that's a big way redlining has affected us today. And some other ways that redlining affected us today was because of the fact that where redlining is, you can see like, I don't know, they have the modern map here, but there's a, there should be like a comparison from now and then back then. And so basically where redlining happened, a lot of minorities still are right now because a lot of the areas where a lot of the areas where people who are white were, like there was a lot more money to go around. There was businesses, companies there, and they, and those areas were just able to build up generational wealth, meaning that like the areas there are like more expensive. So a lot of people from like these communities that didn't get those same privileges, like have more money. Also, I would like to add that um, the deep entanglement that redlining has on different communities and neighborhoods today is denying people to, to have access or to be in the vicinity or a certain area to have access to the resources that they depend on and that they need. And that's also, also, adding on to another thing really quickly, I would also like to say the fact that like redlining, even though it's illegal today, we still see the lasting effects of it. And I wanna pass it on to Lanaya. I would like to um to end this off. Um, redlining was redlining was the fuel or like the wood for racialized ec um economy in like the sense for every dollar a black person makes, typically a white person will make fifteen dollars, which put us in like the what is it called the um, racial wealth gap? Yeah, racial wealth gap. Yes. And on to the next slide. I don't some. Okay. So solutions are taking action. So what can we do to make housing more affordable for the people who need it? So there are many ways that we like that both you and the community can help make affordable housing more affordable for those who need it, as well as helping people find the resources they need in order to get affordable housing. And some of these ways involve donating or like or like on meetings with people who specialize in these causes. Other ways are just spreading awareness. I'll list a few of them. So, okay, Housing First Program. What is the Housing First Program? The Housing First Program is a program that gives unhoused people access to housing and then provides them with resources after. So basically what this housing program does, it helps, you, it helps people who, who are in need find a house and it assess them with, with the resources so they can continue keeping that house as well as making it so that it, again, can get basic human needs such as healthcare, food, clothes, shoes, and just overall stuff that they need. Okay, and access to high, another way is access to high income jobs, free program certificate, Certifications that open doors for jobs and paperwork assistance. So the reason why these are so important, all of these are required for affordable housing. High paying income jobs are important if you want to keep your house or if you need to pay off loans because like a lot of people, even in poor, like low income neighborhoods, they still have loans that they need to pay off, whether it be student loans, car loans, things like that. They still need loans that they still need to get these loans and pay them off. So it's really important to have a good paying job so you don't go further in the debt. Because like, if you go further in the debt, it lowers your credit score. And like, if your credit score is lowered, some jobs when you apply, look at your credit score, 
like some housing places, they look at your credit score. Your credit score is extremely important when it comes to finding all these like things and resources. So it's very important that like you have a good job so you can afford to keep making these payments so your life doesn't get harder than it already is. Free programs. There are many forms of free programs. Some are like food programs, such as, for example, I'm going to use food stamps as an example. And like housing programs too, those exist. Like all these free programs are very important, especially like when it comes to like affordable housing. So if you want to ever help out one of these causes, it's very good to advocate for like these free programs or help people find these programs. Also certifications that open doors for jobs along with paperwork. These two tie in together because a lot of the time when it comes to homelessness, a bunch of people aren't homeless just because like they spend their money on things such as drugs, which is like a very harmful stereotype. Some people just don't, first of all, they don't have their documentation because if you're on the street, what's the chance that you're gonna still have a credit, like you're still gonna have like your birth certificate, your social security number. There's a very low chance of that. And a lot of these people don't have these things. So it's very important to have paperwork assistance along with like certificate, like along with things that open the door so you're available to get a job. Because a lot of the time, like, Sometimes um, people who are like lower income are turned away for like poor hygiene, which is unfair to an extent because if you turn away somebody for poor hygiene that they can't control because let's say they don't have a house, they can't pay their water bill or like they just have other problems, then like the doors aren't open for that person. So by opening the doors and making people more open, or convincing companies, businesses to be more accepting of people. That's a good way to advocate for like, that's a good way to advocate for people who are lower income. Also, that also leads to more, op that also leads to possible opportunities for you in the future, especially when it comes to like, especially when it comes to business owners, a lot of the time, like there's companies that specialize in like advocating for these people, not only will it help you build connections, but it's also gonna help communities. Another thing I want to talk about is access to assistance outside of outside of shelters. When it comes to shelters, a lot of people think that shelters are the answers to a lot of things, but the truth is shelters are temporary. A lot of the time shelters get overfilled. They have a, like a lack of privacy. And overall, some people just don't want to live in shelters because of these reasons. So it's important to advocate for affordable housing so we can get people into permanent placements rather than temporary ones. We're like, in the end, they're just gonna end up on the streets again. Like there's a good probability that they are. And if this happens then, like all the work that somebody would have put into like putting into a shelter, it would be gone because it's just a constant cycle. Okay. Um, having government owned housing and low income areas. The reason why this is important because it's a type of affordable housing, we need to advocate for this more because in low income neighborhoods, this is where people mostly need it. And how can young people and adults work together to create change? So there's many ways that young people and adults can work together to create change, whether it's spreading awareness over open conversations around affordable housing. Like you can talk to people about these resources that they can find. You can advocate for these resources they can find. And even like you can donate to like organizations who specialize in this. Working together with individuals that have secure funding this means like you can work with businesses, people with, like charities, people who specialize in this. And like I said before, it not only helps you establish like your own connections when it comes to things such as business, but it helps the community as well. And having these conversations to raise awareness in schools, because chances are even in like schools that are in like higher income neighborhoods, there could still be somebody like who has a low income family or someone who comes from a low income background in those schools. So it's very important to talk about these, these issues, these topics, and as well as advocate for these to let people know, hey, there are options out there for you. And that's the end of my slide of solutions and taking actions. And thank you for listening to our presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions? To pipe up, um, yes. so to put it in chat. What? Oh. 
You want the question? In, in, you want us to say the question or to put it in chat? Um, you can say it or put it in chat. Either works. Okay. So I'm just, I see somebody else's hand up, but I just wanted to ask, um, what was it like for you to do this research? And was there anything that really surprised you or that you really, um, was really an important for you that you learned? Okay. It seemed like you're really super prepared and you learned a lot because that was a lot of really great information. And very impressive. So I'm curious about what the research was like for you. Okay, so along the way of this of this like project and like studying all the information, I learned the deeper meaning of redlining and how far back it goes and how it still affects our community today. Also, the deeper meaning of affordable housing and just housing in general and how people have a misconception of like off the bat saying, oh yeah, they just put you in a house and you're good to go. And so, yeah. um, I also had a deeper understanding about redlining because I didn't even know what it was until I started doing this and also learned how redlining affects areas and um, what it is. Oh no, what it is and how it affects certain areas in over the years. Um, the two things that like really shocked me the most was one, how much credit scores actually matter when like you're trying to find housing jobs and overall like things you need, especially even when it's like taking out loans and interest. And the other thing that like really shocked me was the fact that like, was just the fact that like redlining like also has to do with redlining redlining has like such a deep impact on both history and today now we're still suffering from the effects of it um i would like to say that i learned redlining in affordable housing while in my time in debate club and at school it was a very interesting topic to learn about especially since the outlasting facts still are like going around Oh, oh, the research. Honestly, this was like, like it was a lot of information. Some things were a little hard to find, mm -hmm. but it's like overall, it was just like I think it was a good experience. Like it taught us more about like statistics and like what like affordable housing is really like. Because before, I feel like um I don't know, like I speak for you guys too, but like we kind of had a broad understanding of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything that you covered, so thank you. Yeah, I see Connie has a question, Reggie. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why it's showing my desk and computer though. That's a completely, I'm not sure, sure why, but I just wanted to thank you all uh, for a very articulate description of affordable housing. It's it's a such a big problem and how to approach it. And I, I'm always shocked by the redlining of the banks in Boston. And um, what, which banks were the, which banks were involved in this very serious redlining that occurred? And my second question is, um, don't they have some responsibility to, to um, make an effort to support affordable housing as a result of this? So when it comes to the banks, we're not actually as like 100% sure of what banks were like involved when it came to redlining, because like it wasn't just one bank, it was a group of banks in general. And the second part of the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from, from experience, from where I live, one bank that I can notice we see is like, it's really far out from where I live, uh, is DCU. I like I would have to like go all the, I don't know exactly where it's located. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. like, a good while away. It's a, like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good while away. Just to go to a certain bank like that I specifically go to. And honestly, I've wondered for a while why it was so far. So that's like the only bank that I know personally that's that probably been affected by redlining. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the question was closer to yeah. like do you think that banks should be playing more active role? So even though banks are the cause, and I feel like they should have like some type of obligation to like try and fix the effects, unfortunately, banks just aren't like that. 
because like when it comes to banks, we had a fin we had a financial literacy class here. Yes. And like because of that <laughs> financial literacy class, like we learned like how banks actually are. They're more worried about making money rather than like more like worried than helping people. A lot of the times banks do things that we view as kind or like just overall things that we think are good when really banks are like trying to just get money. So even though they should, they definitely aren't going to like try and go back, fix their mistakes and support the community. Okay, well, thank you. But really, thank you for the great presentation. Okay. And I think there's one question that came in through the chat and it's from Aliciana. And it is, why is it important for other youth in our community to discuss housing inequality? Other youths? Um, I can't see. Yeah. You want to go on a word? Um. Yeah, I think we should go there. Before I start, I feel like it's important for people to be aware about this issue and like talk about it because you never know who's going through this or who needs to know this certain the certain type of information. Like Naya said in her slides, like most kids, like your parents or your family could probably be going from house to house to house or from program to program to help you like to help you like balance everything out and you never know who needs to hear this information or who needs to like get a background understanding of this stuff. Yeah. Oh um it's important so that we know what it is and we know how to approach it in the future once it comes around to us we're an adult. Okay. And for me, the reason why I think it's important because like, so our school is in a lower income neighborhood. So I think it's really good for like people to know they have these resources around them and like to know that like these types of things exist. I feel like it's something that like schools, communities and other things should be open about, especially since we're like, like in a lower income neighborhood, these things are like especially needed. So that's why I think like it's very important to like have these open discussions and not treat it like it's something that's like, to be ashamed of. When I, um, I I also think it's important because tracing back to what Lacerda said, housing is a quality of life that everybody should have a right to and everybody should have access to. Shouldn't be something that like you should be denied of or something that is closed off to you. So it's very important for you to know that about that. Uh, I think we have another question from Curtis. I was just gonna say you guys did a really great job in your presentation and giving like the landscape of like the redlining piece. And I was really um excited to see how you guys spoke about the redlining um and how it affects uh, the urban communities and specifically how you guys highlighted the the top prominent uh, communities, Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan, and what's that's really prominent into what we call Boston and our inner city communities. But beyond that, also, um, I like enjoyed your call to action. I think that's where it really sat with me. Our call to your call to action um, when you said that we should be sharing these conversations more with people within their suburban communities because in suburban communities, there are low income family members or low income students that are in those communities, right? And they should know that this equity when the conversation's happening. Um, but also, um, you get yeah, call to action also said that programs should be able to offset uh, some of their costs for these programmings for young people to participate in, right? In which I looked at, that was more so how the YMCA, right? YMCA within the Boston and Roxbury should say, hey, we got free scholarships for young people to join based off of whatever it looks like. So I, I really enjoyed your call to action. So I just want to shout you out and say you guys did a really great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question from Rebecca. Wow. You, you know, <laughs> I, I'm trying to remember when I was in eighth grade or ninth grade or 10th grade, and I knew nothing about these issues. And the amount of knowledge that you have gathered together as a team, I also just want to shout out you're working together as a team, was really a wonderful dynamic to see. But I hope I hope you will feel empowered going forward in using this knowledge and, and, and what you and your research skills to really 
help your community get better informed. You're, I can see you all as future leaders. Keep it going, please. <laughs> There's a lot, Thank so you. much potential. And for, for put and for sharing it with us. I learned a lot tonight. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Everybody. Um Monique, and, Monique, would you like to join me in, in, in thanking the young people and signing off for our last community conversation? Absolutely, sure. Many, many, many thanks to every one of you who presented tonight. Your research certainly came through. People learned a lot from you. And oftentimes we as adults see you as our future leaders. No, you are the leaders of today and right now. And I'm grateful to have you guys leading us. And I appreciate all the work that went in. Thank you to Reggie. Thank you to Elsie, all the behind the scenes support, guidance um, from Ms. Kina, who was also on, um, Curtis, everybody. It is a grateful, grateful, grateful abundance coming to each and every one of you. Thank you all for joining us for this season of Community Conversations. Again, thank you, Mary Margaret, any final words? share i want the young people to hear these words from one of our partner organizations um there's a the, the coordinator for that organization uh kina banda and she sent she had to hop off for another meeting but she listened to most of what you had to say and i want to kind of share these words that she sent me by email um she said, I'm so proud of these young people navigating difficult terms and deeply painful issues around housing. They are the magic and the light of the future, bringing healing and hope to the people. So I hope you can drink in those words um, because they're true. So thank you for bringing your magic and your light uh, to this final episode of Community Conversations this year. And I will say well wishes from many people, Miss Roxanne and Elsie as well. Great job to all of you. Thank you all. Have a Thank good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>